All right, YouTube, Nate Silver had already been demoted to Nate Bronze, but now he's Nate Iron Ore because uh, part of his prophecy has already come true. He look link in the description to one of the tweets that he made. He made several tweets much earlier in the year. Uh, one was that uh, the possibility of a Cubs at Cleveland matchup in the World Series, which is what we saw, Chicago Cubs and the Cleveland Indians, of course, and the Cubs won, uh, was slightly more likely than a Trump victory. Of course, back then he basically discounted Trump's odds. Uh, that has now happened, so there's the first part. Uh, the other part of his prophecy was that, oh, the, well, the Cubs will win, and then eight days later, Trump will be the next president of the United States. Link in the description. Now, I'm not sure why he said eight days. Uh, because I, I'm pretty sure that that's actually wrong. I'm pretty sure that it's five days, but uh, uh, regardless of his uh, numerological faults there, turns out half of that, of course, has come true. The Cubs did win the World Series. Uh, doesn't it seem like things that are, are wildly unlikely, at least in the minds of people like Silver that deal with numbers, uh, have come to pass this year, the Chicago Cubs aside? Uh, Trump was never favor until well after Super Tuesday. It wasn't even until Indiana's primary that people talked about him being the presumptive GOP nominee. Uh, I was calling it likely that Trump would be the nominee as early as South Carolina. Uh, after Nevada came in, it became even more likely there was no longer uh, the the only per other person who had won a state was Ted Cruz, who never had a chance. He was locked into the Santorum corner, as I called it, and I was correct. Uh, Rubio was his real challenger, but Rubio fell apart before Super Tuesday and then went on to get fucked by Christie. Uh, at that point, when Rubio faltered, it was clear that Trump was going to be the Republican nominee. Uh, meanwhile, people like Nate Silver still considered it less than a 50-50 chance that that would happen. They still wanted to believe that it would be Rubio out of nowhere, Jeb out of nowhere, Ted Cruz as the slightly more right-wing candidate would take it somehow. And that was not going to happen. And these people were all wrong, uh, just as they discounted the possibility out of, out of hand because, it you know, the Cubs hadn't even been to a World Series in, what, a century or so. Um, the Cleveland Indians were in a similar boat. So you've got these two long drought teams that haven't actually been there, certainly haven't won it. They're the teams at the World Series. And the intonation of the tweets that Silver, or, or Iron Ore, I should say, at the time was making was that both events were uh, almost insurmountably unlikely. That is, that while he gave it as a token that there was technically a chance that Trump would be the nominee, that it would be a Cubs-Indians World Series, the Cubs would win the World Series, he was saying it specifically with the eye to humor, as in, well, yeah, it, it can happen, but we all know that it's not going to. And he did the same thing for Trump as nominee for months and months, long after, I think about almost two months after I had already said, well, Trump now has an advantage. Uh, he's now more likely than anyone else to win. It took him an extra almost two months to admit that that was the case. By the time he caught up to saying, yes, Trump now has an advantage, he was already a shoe in He was guaranteed to become the Republican nominee, or just shy of guaranteed. They would have had to pull a lot of last-minute strings to get him uh, below the threshold at which he clinches in order to force it into a contested convention in which they could jerry-rig Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or somebody in as the nominee, and that was never likely to happen. The odds of it were astronomically small. He was the one that was wrong, because he said it was an astronomically small uh, uh, chance that Trump would be the nominee even after he won three of the first four states, even after he won more than half the states on Super Tuesday. And now Nate Silver, once again, is severely underestimating Trump's odds in the general, to the point at which he had to make a tweet some, I think, about a week ago, where he said, oh, well, yeah, there's every possibility that there's, pol there's systemic polling bias or something. You know why he dropped that tweet? It's because he wants to cover his ass. If Trump wins, which I think is increasingly very likely, uh, it's above a 90% chance in my estimation now. Watch Pennsylvania on voting night. If Pennsylvania uh, flips to Trump, he's won the election. And we'll know that 100% uh, 
uh, with complete certainty. He'll have won if he flips Pennsylvania. He'll also have won if he flips Virginia. Uh, neither of those scenarios is looking increasingly likely, let's face it. Um, uh, he's, he's severely underestimating his odds of winning. He lifted Trump up in his uh, uh, total from a little bit under a 10% chance to now about, I think, a 35% chance at the last uh, mention, at least the last time I looked at it. Uh, I think that that's an underestimation. And the reason, uh, the reason why he's doing this, he's pulling a Scott Adams here. His aggregated numbers, the polls that he's looking at, he gives Hillary Clinton a significant advantage so that if he win, if she wins, he can say, aha, well, you know, my, my estimation was correct. I gave her the higher possibility of winning, and so she won. Uh, I was right. That's what he's trying to do. At the same time, he drops a tweet saying, oh, but there might also be systemic polling bias, so that if Trump wins, it will almost certainly be because the polls underestimated his actual support uh, and were scattered. They were all over the place, and they still are. It's, it's beginning to look a little bit more cohesive in the polling. That is, they're starting, the spread is, is shrinking closer to the election but there's still a lot of scatter involved. So you have one poll showing Trump up by five, another showing Clinton up by three. And again, all the politicos and the being liberals and the salons, as well as, by the way, the, the, uh, the Breitbarts and the Blazes and so forth, they're all picking and choosing which poll they want to believe. They're all pulling a Karl Rove in this election. Regardless of what happens, somebody's gonna be really messed up and, and not understanding reality and will be very confused. Now, after the election, I say Trump has the tailwind. His opponent's been capped by scandal. Uh, the scandal is still growing. It's still in the news cycle. It's likely to be for the next few days. That doesn't give her enough time to recover. I don't think she will. She'll be at the bottom of a trough while he's riding a peak going into the election. It looks like he's going to flip most of the battleground states. It looks like New North Carolina no longer even looks like a battleground state. It looks like he's solidified a lead there of five or six points. The same is true of Ohio. It looks like he's got Ohio. It looks like he's likely got Florida. Uh, electoral fraud down there aside, of course. There are tales of that. And so Nate Silver now is trying to cover his ass. He realized that his expectations based solely on algorithms and the disbelief in a paradigm shift hasn't served him well. He was wrong on the World Series. He was wrong on the Republican primaries. He was wrong about Michigan. He was wrong all along about Trump's chances. He still is wrong. He's severely underestimating the odds of a Trump victory. The reason why is he still hasn't fully embraced the concept that we've undergone a social paradigm shift. It's affecting the election. The Rust Belt is no longer hegemonic and being blue. It's beginning to turn red. Some of these other fringe states that he assumed were out of Trump's reach, no longer look out of Trump's reach, to the point at which he could grab up Virginia. I discounted Virginia, too. I thought it was a lost cause myself. I said Pennsylvania is more likely to flip. It now looks like if he grabs up both, I'll tell you this. On the night of the election, and I'll be live streaming, trust me, uh, and I'm going to admonish you over and over to vote if you haven't voted while watching the live stream. If anyone's holding out, you're eligible to vote and you haven't, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ban you from the live stream. Uh, and I'll tell you, okay, well, you go vote and then you come back and you can get unbanned or something like that. Do your civic duty. Unless you're not in the U.S., of course, then it doesn't matter. If you're like, you know, you're a Spaniard, <laughs> you're Japanese or something, probably not as big an issue. I, I, I can't imagine that uh, you're going to make the flight in time <laughs> to actually cast a, a fake ballot or something like that. Uh, but on the, on the night of voting, keep something in mind. Watch three states, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Florida. That would be my best guess as to the uh, eastern states of no. If Pennsylvania flips towards Trump, then he, he's probably already won. If Virginia flips towards Trump, he's probably already won. Because it would show that states that were, for some months there, uh, leaning blue, have gone red, that he's outperforming expectations, which means he probably has a good chance of getting Nevada and Colorado, which is all he needs to win, by the way. If he grabs up, if he takes Pennsylvania out of the Clinton camp, there's no way she can really cobble together 270. 
unless she outperforms in all of the other battleground states. She'd have to win Iowa. She'd have to win Colorado. She'd have to win Nevada. Uh, she'd probably have to win Florida at that point. If he flips all three, then I'll declare him the victor before we even get any numbers from the western states. If it looks like he's got a two or three point lead with, you know, 30, 40 percent of the votes counted, I'll call the election for Trump at that point. If, on the other hand, it looks like he's come in behind in those three states, I'll be likely to call the election for Hillary Clinton before we see any of the western states. I don't think that I'm going to have to do that, though. If he's got the wind at his tail, with his opponent suffering more and more from the FBI scandal, among other things, uh, I don't think she can make up lost ground. I, there aren't enough battleground states out west. Even if McMullen takes Utah, she somehow grabs up Arizona, she still wouldn't get to 270. Pennsylvania will be the bellwether. People are talking about North Carolina. North Carolina is no longer your bellwether. Pennsylvania is, which couldn't be worse for Clinton because she was leading by a larger margin there at her peak than she ever was in, in North Carolina. The fact that it's shifted enough for Pennsylvania to be the new bellwether uh, and for Florida to look increasingly like Trump has already won it as well, as well as Ohio and North Carolina. That's probably the worst news she could get, because she needs the electoral votes from Pennsylvania. Even if she were to win all the other battlegrounds and eke out a win, it would be by a couple of electoral points. Can you say no mandate? And also watch the state of Vermont right here. You may see Bernie Sanders in the double digits. You may see Hillary Clinton lose this state. It looks safe blue on paper because it's gone blue for cycle after cycle, usually by high levels. But Clinton in the WCAX poll didn't break 50%, which means that if some of her supporters cast ballots for Bernie Sanders, if she loses the younger Democrats and the Bernie bro Democrats that are here in Vermont, she could end up losing this state either to Sanders or to Trump. If that happens, that could if, if she otherwise would have eked out a win by an electoral point or two, she could lose the election because of Bernie Sanders being popular in the state of Vermont. And I would admonish my fellow Vermonters, if you are if you can't vote for Trump, I would encourage you to vote for Bernie Sanders or Gary Johnson or Jill Stein or somebody. Because if this state goes away from Hillary Clinton, it could, number one, tip the election. Number two, it would be a huge punishment for the DNC. It would show them that the Democratic Party uh, is increasingly disturbed uh, by what the DNC was doing in the primaries. You're never going to get a socially progressive candidate if you put up with that sort of crap. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's some of my expectations. Nate Iron Ore has really screwed the pooch on this one. Uh, he must be crying. I, I said he was crying into his third shot of schnapps last night, and I think honestly he is. There's a little bit of a mini cat fight going on here. Uh, Cleopatra, could you not attack your brother, please? Come on, kitty. Be reasonable. Uh, but yeah, uh, Nate Iron Ore is, uh, has uh, two losses, and now he's hoping to get a win on his major prediction, which is the outcome of the election. But he had to drop, essentially, what amounts to a de facto disclaimer and say, oh yeah, but the polls might be totally rigged. So if I'm wrong, it's not my numbers' fault, it's the polls' fault. He's trying to shift the blame there. He's pulling a total Scott Adams there and trying to take both sides uh, so that he can weasel his way out of it. If he's wrong, which I think he is on the election numbers-wise, he can he has a ready excuse for why specifically he's wrong. Oh, I'm just a numbers man. I had no way of knowing that the polls were, you know, uh, five points biased in favor of Democrats. I had no way of knowing that Trump was going to flip Pennsylvania. The numbers didn't lie. The numbers were totally right. I'm just a numbers man. And then I'll I'll go back through and I'll start talking about, oh, well, you ignored the numbers completely when it came to the Republican primaries. You ignore the numbers constantly. That's why you failed. That's about all. Peace out.